want you to turn to Matthew chapter 6 first, and then Deuteronomy chapter 15. And if you don't have a Bible and you would like a Bible, we actually have free Bibles that are available at our Connect area in the lobby. Just go by after service, somebody on our team there, and just say, can I have a Bible? We would love to put a Bible in your hands today. So two passages of Scripture, Matthew chapter 6 and Deuteronomy 15. Now today we are starting a brand new sermon series that we're calling, here it is, Living Large, Living Large. And um, I don't know about you, but I want to live a large life. And we live in a world right now, a culture that tells us that living large is about what you possess. So if you can just get the right job, if you could have the right salary, if you could build the right business, if you could build up the right amount of savings, if you could buy the right house in the right neighborhood, if you could drive the right car, if you have the, the right latest and greatest technology, if you build up the, the right stock portfolio, if you have the right 401k and retirement package, if you go on the right vacations, you have the right diamond ring on your finger, then then and only then can you live a large life. And that's what our world tells us. Make no mistake about it. Our culture tells us that living large is about what you possess. But the Bible actually says something totally different. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 24, which is our theme verse for this series, it says something totally different. It says that the world of the generous gets larger and larger. And the world of the stingy, the world of... The, of just collecting as much as you can for yourself, that world actually gets smaller and smaller. See, this verse says that living large is not about what you possess. No, this verse says that living large is about what you release. This verse says that a large life is actually a generous life. Now, let me address the potential uh, elephant in the room because some of you may hate it when the topic of generosity comes up in church. Some of you may like strongly dislike whenever the topic of money is talked about in church. It could right now be a massive turnoff. You may be thinking right now like, I knew it. I knew that this church was just like every other church and the church is only after my money. And if that's what you're thinking, let me look you in the eyes and let me assure you, no, we are not. We never have been. In fact, you need to know that in the history of our church, we have never asked anybody for money. And we won't start today. From day one, we have unapologetically always asked you to ask God if and what you should give and then simply be obedient, simply do what God tells you to do. That's why one of our 10 values as a church, and we have 10 values that answer the question, what makes us uniquely us? It really is like the core of who we are. And really our values, they always determine our decisions. So we have these 10 values that we want, if you call our church home, for they to be your values, not just here at an organization, but our personal values. And one of our values is generosity is our privilege. We don't have to give, we get to give. And so from day one, we have had that value that generosity is our privilege. Listen to me very carefully. We refuse to use guilt as a weapon to manipulate you into giving money to the church. I am trying, listen, I'm trying to get the guilt off of you, not the guilt on you. So in this series, let your guard down, people. Breathe a little bit. We're good. No right from the jump that we don't want anything from you. Like, there's not gonna be a surprise giving campaign at the end of this. There's not gonna be, oh, guess what? Here's a building campaign. Well, come on in faith, let's start giving. That's not coming. That's not happening. We don't want anything from you. Listen, we want everything for you. And, and I'll prove it. Uh, because a lot of the content that we'll talk about over the, over the next four weeks of our church it comes from this book, and this book has is, is literally changed my life, and it is a book called The Blessed Life uh, by Pastor Robert Morris, who is the founding lead pastor uh, at Gateway Church in Dallas, which is where um, myself 
and my wife, my family, we were a part of the church there. It's an amazing church there, and we were on staff there for five years, and they're one of our sending churches. And, uh, and t- in my humble, I think yet accurate opinion, um, this is the best, most balanced book on biblical generosity that I've ever read. So I want to prove it, that like I don't want anything from you. I want, I, I want everything for you. So here's what we've decided. We've decided that we're going to be generous and that generosity is our privilege. And so we're going to give every single person who wants one a free copy of this book in this series. Uh, literally, free 99. Yeah, like nothing. Like It's not like donations accepted. No, we will not accept a donation. We want to give you this book because, because I, I want to help you. I want to help you. And it really is our privilege to be generous. And so they're not in today, uh, but we are hoping to have those in by next week. And so make sure that, that, that you're here next week, one. Uh, but then in the, if you want one, we'll give you a book, seriously. Uh, but here's what I am going to ask. I'm going to ask if you take one, read it, uh, because this is an investment into you. And so if you want to grow, if you want to learn more about what the Bible says about generosity, even more than what we're talking about, I'm telling you, this book will help you. So please hear me. Please hear me. Our only motivation for this series is to help you. That's it. Our only motivation is to help you. And the truth is, I can't stand before God one day and and call myself a good pastor and not talk about this subject. Because the Bible... Uh, has a whole lot to say about this subject. In fact, there are 215 verses on faith. How many of you would say faith is a very important thing in this whole in this whole following Jesus thing? Very important. That's so there's 215 verses on faith. There are 218 verses on salvation. How many of you would say that is extremely important? Yes, it's very nobody. Okay, cool. Um, Just me? Okay. That's cool. We'll get there. Um, Just stay with us. Okay. Um, But I want you to see this. There are are not 219, there are 2,058 verses on money. In fact, there are five times more verses about money than about prayer. And Jesus said more about money than heaven and hell combined. And Jesus shared 38 parables. We actually did a series a couple years ago called Parables. He shared 38 of, and 16 of those bad boys are about money. So we need to recognize that the Bible has so much to say about this subject. And I want you to hear my heart. Like my job as a pastor, my job as your pastor is to equip you for life. That is actually my job. My job is to equip you for life outside of this room not to entertain you on Sundays. That's not my role. My role is to song and dance and just entertain. Hopefully I do it in an entertaining way. (laughs) But, like, I care a lot about that. But my, my main job is to equip you for life. And I have such a deep conviction and a calling from God to help you succeed as a follower of Jesus in every single area of your life, including this area. And here's why, because this area, let's just be honest, it affects every single one of us. There's not one of us this week who hasn't thought about money and hasn't thought about, okay, with this area of my life, it affects every single one of us. So today, if you're taking notes, which I hope you are, uh, we're gonna kick off this series with a message entitled, It's All About the Heart. It's all about the heart. You may think that it's about money, but it's not. It's all about the heart. Let's pray. Um, God, will you deal with our heart today? In Jesus' name, amen. That was a longer intro than I normally do. We got to get right to it, okay? Uh, How many of you would agree uh, that the heart, even though it's not the biggest muscle in your body, that it is one of the most important muscles in your body. Anybody would agree with that statement? Uh, Because when the heart stops working, everything stops working. Uh, That when your heart's not right, everything's not right. And I want you to hear this. That's true physically and that's true spiritually. In fact, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says this, Above all else, guard your heart 
for everything that you do actually flows from your heart. He talks about above anything, above serving, above loving, above attending church, above, above everything, guard your heart because everything actually is affected and it flows from your heart. And today I wanna show you that even giving, even generosity is all about the heart. Now, let me show you this in Matthew chapter six. This is actually my favorite chunk of scripture on this topic in the Bible. Matthew chapter six, starting in verse 19, it says, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin, moths, that was hard to say, moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then this is my favorite one verse on giving in the entire Bible. You ready? Verse 21, it says, For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let me read that one more time. Let's let this sink in to our souls today. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And I want you to notice the order. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says that our heart always follows our treasure. That's the order. Jesus says in this scripture that our heart always follows our treasure, not the other way around. We often think that our treasure always follows after our heart, that our heart actually leads the way and then our treasure follows, but that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says that our heart always follows our treasure that our treasure actually leads the way, and then our heart begins to follow. Let me say it this way, that our hearts are always directly connected to how we spend our money. So, think about this. If you want your heart in the kingdom of God, if you want your heart in building the church, put your treasure there. If you want your heart in your marriage, put your treasure there. Come on, fellas, buy some spontaneous just because flowers. Budget for consistent date nights. Pay a babysitter. Go on a vacation just for the two, two of you. I am preaching now to, to all the parents that are in the room. Listen, if you want your heart in your marriage, you put your treasure there. If you want your heart in your kids' sports, in soccer clubs, in fall ball, in cheerleading, just put your treasure there. Pay those dues. Buy that equipment, purchase private lessons, do all the camps. Listen, I'm fully convinced that the crazy, out of control parents in the stands act like a lunatic so much because they're spending so much money. <laughs> That's why you know, I'm giving so much money. I'm, I, man, my heart is in this. That's why you ever thought about that? Listen, if you want your heart in anything, put your money into it. For example, think about this if you invest in a stock, what do we do? I promise, if you invest in a stock, you'll start to care about that stock. You'll start going online probably every day, probably multiple times a day, right? To see how that stock is doing. Even though you have never checked stocks before in your life or cared about stocks in your entire life, even though you checking it won't change it, you will check that stock over and over and over. What changed? Well, you put your money there and now your heart follows. You see, that's what Jesus says in Matthew chapter six. Now, I personally really learned this principle and this principle got solidified just in my life uh, when we lived in Oklahoma City way back in the day. It was actually 15 years ago that we lived in Oklahoma City. We were part of an amazing church there. It's where I actually met David and I initially met Lauren. Uh, so we go way back. And so when I was there, uh, here's how God taught this to me. It's when my wife bought me to this day the best Christmas present that I've ever gotten. And it was a gift that kept on giving and it was Oklahoma City Thunder season tickets. Oh, she did good that year. She did good. In fact, the, the, these, these are my seats, okay? Uh, we were in the top bowl. Uh, we were, it was in the, the 300s, so we were up there. Uh, it, it, was, it was called Loud City. So I, I was a youth pastor. I had youth pastor seats, but hey, I was in the building. And so 
And so those are my seats. We had, we had these seats for uh, like part of, I think, seven different seasons um, and did that. And, and I'm telling you, uh, I've always been a huge sports fan. Like my whole life, I've always loved sports. From the time I was a little kid, I loved sports. I loved playing sports. I played sports. And I, I've always loved watching sports. And I've always had favorite teams. I've always cheered on my favorite teams. But I've never cared about a sports team more than the Thunder when I had those seats. I'm telling you, I watched every second of every game, every home game, every away game, even the ones on the West Coast. I'm telling you, I stayed up. I watched every one when I was in those seats. We never, we were never the fans that were leaving before that fourth quarter buzzer went off. No, we stayed to the very end. We were in it to win it. We were not going to be fickle. If you're down, I don't care. God can do miracles. We can come back. And we were there all the time. Like, um, LA, I stayed up late. I, I listened to multiple, I started listening to multiple, multiple Thunder podcasts a week. I analyzed every single off season move. I bought t shirts. I bought t shirts. I bought more t shirts. Oh, bad throw. I bought more t shirts. Okay, I bought more t shirts. And this is all the ones that I have 15 years later. We had so many t-shirts at one time that my wife, with her artistic skills, made a blanket out of all the extra t-shirts that we had. I'm telling you, we might need to take care of that right there. Um, but like, I want you to see, like, I cared so much. I cared more than any other sports team than ever before. And it's still been 15 years and I still care. Why? Why? Because my heart was following my treasure. So let me make this crystal clear to you, church. God has never wanted your money. God has never wanted your money. He has never needed your money. He is just fine. He has never wanted your money. Listen, he's always wanted your heart. Always, but he knows that your heart always follows your money. So when it comes to generosity, it's not about money. It really is all about the heart. So if it is all about the heart, today I want to answer this question. So how do we develop the right heart? Because if it is about the heart, I don't know about you, but I want to have the right heart. And so there's some verses that are in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy that answer this very question. And we're gonna go verse by verse through Deuteronomy chapter 15 because I think it beautifully paints out, paints a picture of the heart that we should have. In Deuteronomy chapter 15, starting in verse seven, here's what it says. If anyone is poor among your fellow Israelites in any of the towns of the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not be hard-hearted or tight-fisted towards them. I want you to notice that. I want you to notice that a hard heart leads to a tight fist. I want you to see that. And that's the wrong heart, right? That's not the heart that God wants us to have. But then it says, rather, he says, here's the right heart, be open-handed. Another translation actually says, be generous and freely lend them whatever they need. That's the right heart. This is the heart that God wants us to have. And then the next few verses actually tell us how to get that heart. Four things today. Uh, I got to go through this really fast, okay? I've got, I've got 16 more minutes. Here's number one. Write this down. Deal with a selfish heart. Deal with a selfish heart. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 9. It's the first thing we got to do. We got to deal with a selfish heart. Verse 9, it says this. Be careful not to harbor this wicked thought. And here's the wicked thought. The seventh year... The year for canceling debts is near. I'll tell you about that in just a moment. So that you do not show ill will towards the needy among your fellow Israelites and give them nothing. They may then appeal to the Lord against you and you will be found guilty of sin. Now to understand this verse, you need to know that in the Old Testament, God implemented an economic system where all debts, get this, were canceled every seven years. How many of you would like to go back to that economic system 
that God, anybody got some student loans? Anybody got some credit card debt? Be like, that would be awesome. For in seven years, that bad boy, just a poof, gone. Just that would be so great. Well, that was the economic system in the Old Testament that God gave his people. Now, here's what this verse is saying. We, we got to understand this. This verse is saying that when somebody comes to you and asks to borrow from you, and you actually have the means to help them, but it's six months away from that seven-year kick-in. It's six months away from all the debt being canceled, which means that they realistically will not be able to pay you back, and you know it. Here's what this verse is saying. In those moments where you can help, but you know that they're not gonna be able to pay you back, you're gonna be tempted to be, to be selfish and to not be generous. And here's what God says. He says, that's a heart issue. That's not a money issue, that's a heart issue. And here's what we have to understand is that selfishness attacks before we give. So before we have an opportunity to give, that's when selfishness will attack. And here's the truth. We are all born selfish. All of us, every single one of us, we are all born selfish. If you don't believe me, ask any parent that's in the room right now. Right? Parents, we never have to teach our kids to be selfish. We never have to sit down and give them that lesson. We never have to say, okay, come here, Jordan. Come here, Caleb. Let me teach you how to be selfish. They just do that. They just happens to be wired on the inside of them. In fact, one of the first words of every kid, come on, is behind. I didn't tell you to say that. It's like, there's mama, there's dada, and mine, right? It's like, go, go right now to Queen City Kids. Go in there. I bet you will hear that word over and over again. Mine, 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 mine. And it's kind of cute. Whenever, whenever people are doing that at, at, at a year and a half, but it's not as cute when we're doing it in our 30s and 40s and 50s. It's mine, mine, mine. Like, like you need to understand we are all born selfish, but the good news is, church, is that we are all born again generous. So I, I, I want you to think about this question. I think this is a very important question for us to kind of think about at the very start of this series is why did God invent generosity? You ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about why did God invent generosity? People didn't come up with that. God came up with that. So why? Why did God invent generosity? Now, I've been doing this for a long time, and, um, and here's what I found, is most people think that God invented generosity to support his work. Most, that's the most common answer that you'll get. A lot of times people will say this, oh, God invented to support the work of the ministry. That's it. Just support the work of the ministry. And, um, but l l let's think about this for a moment. So do you really think that God, read Genesis chapter one. Do we really think that God who created the heavens and the earth with his words needs your money to support his work. Like, is, is the light bill in heaven just getting a little bit out of control? Is the, does he need more asphalt for the streets? You know, because read your Bible, it says the, the streets in heaven are made of gold. So like, he just need a little bit more gold for the streets. Get this, get this, get this. So important. God did not create generosity for his sake. He created generosity for our sake. It wasn't for him, it's for us because life is so much better when we're generous. In fact, this is, this is so important. If you wanna know why, generosity is the number one thing that works selfishness and greed out of our lives. How many of you know that we do not need selfishness and greed in our lives? Generosity is the number one thing that can work selfishness and greed out of our life. And that's why you need to understand that we don't buy into nor teach a prosperity gospel. If you've ever heard of that, it's like, we don't roll like that here at our church. We do not teach give to get. That is what a prosperity gospel teaching does. It believes that you give so that you can get. 
And it's almost like, God, I'm gonna give to you so that you'll give me all these things. You are holding back from me, so I have to give so that I can get. But here's what's so toxic about that teaching, and here's what's so toxic about that thinking, is because when we buy into this whole mentality of prosperity gospel that we give to get, that actually, listen, it works selfishness and greed back into your life. And we're trying to work it out of our lives. We don't give to get, we get to give. Generosity is our privilege. So the first thing, we have to deal with a selfish heart. The second thing, and we're just going verse by verse, it, say, we, it says we have to deal with a grieving heart. A grieving heart. Here we see this in verse 10, where it says, give generously to them, and do so without a grudging heart. Another translation says a grieving heart. Another word for that word grudging is grieving. So do not, don't, don't do so with a grieving heart. Then because of the Lord, our God will bless you in all your work and in everything you put your hand to. And this verse says, when you give, do not give with a grieving heart, a heart that is full of grief. In other words, that when you give and then you immediately feel grief and you immediately feel regret, you immediately feel after you give, man, I knew I shouldn't have done that. And here's what we have to understand is selfishness attacks before we give, grief attacks after we give. So if you wanna know after you give what temptation is gonna come your way, it is grief. Is selfishness attacks before we give, grief attacks after we give. Let me illustrate it this way, because I want you to understand why we feel the grief whenever we give. Uh, it's officially November. Anybody excited that, that we're in November? Anybody, anybody, anybody like this time of the year? Um, which means, believe it or not, come on, holidays are right around the corner, and some of us love holidays, some of us hate holidays, we got kind of everything probably represented here. I just want it to be your PSA reminder today is that Thanksgiving is only 18 days away. That's it. 18 days Thanksgiving here. Order your turkeys, okay? Christmas is only 50 days away. Christmas. And how do you know that holidays are expensive? Come on, amen? Can I get an amen from the church? Man, holidays are expensive. Um, it's expensive for me. I got to figure out gifts for my wife, and I got two kids, and it's expensive. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to do everything that's on the boys' list. I saw some of the lists yesterday, and I'm like, nope, can't do that. We ain't going to be able to do that. We got to stay in our financial lane. We cannot do that. Uh, and so I'm just wondering, we're talking about generosity here. Will anybody here, maybe God is putting it on your heart right now, to be generous, to help out your pastor and just give me $100. Oh my goodness, Brad Newton right here. What a man of God. What a generous man that you are. He just did that, look at that, $100 right here, an actual $100 bill. Now, why, why did Brad give me that $100 so fast. See, because he has such a direct connection to the Lord that he knew what was coming. And in his quiet time this morning, he just decided, you know what, I'm gonna get this money. And I just, I just feel in my spirit, I need to give it away. Somebody's gonna declare a need and I'm gonna be able to meet that need in Jesus' name. And he just was here full of faith. No. Why did he, give, why did he so quickly give me that $100? Because I gave it to him before church and I told him to do it. I said, do not let somebody else come up here and do that. I'm going to feel awful if somebody beats you here, okay? So as soon as I say it, jump up here and give me that $100. He gave it to me because I gave it to him, and I, this is my $100. So get this, get this, get this. Is he grieving that he gave me this money? No. He doesn't feel grief that he gave me. Why? because it's not his money. You wanna know why we feel grief after we give? The reason why we grieve after we give is because we think it's ours. But let me tell you what my Bible says. My Bible says in Psalm 24 verse one that the earth 
is the Lord's and everything in it, that the world and all its people belong to him. Psalm 89 verse 11 says, the heavens are yours and the earth is yours. Everything in the world is yours. You created it all. And then I read this this week in my quiet time, uh, Jeremiah chapter 27, verse five. And this is God himself talking. And he says, with my great strength and powerful arm, I made the earth and all its people and every animal. I can give these things of mine to anyone I choose. Now hear what these verses illustrate. It illustrates this truth and we have to understand this. And that is that God is the owner and we are the stewards. We have to understand this. This is one of the most important principles that you can understand following Jesus for the rest of your life, is that God is the owner and we are the stewards. And if you wanna know what stewardship is, I know that can sound like a very like, uh, kind of a geeky term, it's like stewardship, you know, it's like it could be like, like what does that mean? And you only hear that in church. I want you to hear this. Make sure that we're all on the same page. Here's what stewardship is. Stewardship is just simply taking care of something that is not yours. That is what we do. Stewardship is taking care of something that is not yours. And you need to understand this. Life is stewardship because everything we have is God's. And when you understand that, you will never grieve when he tells you to be generous. Well, is this helping anybody today? Okay, so how do we get the right heart? How do we get the right heart? We have to first deal with a selfish heart. Number two, deal with a grieving heart. And then number three, I've got to hurry. Number three, we got to develop a generous heart. We got to develop a generous heart. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 14 says, supply them liberally. That, another word for that is generously. From your flock, your threshing floor, and your wine press, give to them as the Lord your God has blessed you. Here's what God's saying in this verse. I've blessed you. And if you wanna know what my simple definition of the word blessing is, like if he's blessed you, here's what that means. That means that you have more than you need for just yourself. Like I've given you more than just what you need. Like I've given you more, I've blessed you. But listen, that blessing is not just for you. You are blessed actually to be a blessing. I bless you so that you can then in return be generous. We see this in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11. It says, you will be enriched, you will be blessed in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Now in the New Testament, I love to bust out some Greek every now and then, make sure that you, that you are learning this. Uh, the Greek word for blessed is the word makarios. It's the makarios, and that can be translated one of two ways. It can be translated blessed, but that same exact word can be translated happy. So God's word is very clear, cover to cover, that generous people are blessed. Generous people are happy. So here's what's so fascinating. There are so many new secular scientific studies that talk about all the benefits to being generous, even linking people's level of happiness to their level of generosity. In fact, if you wanna do a deep dive study this week, here's a list of a whole bunch of secular non-church articles that you can actually, if you wanna take a picture, they are not gonna stay up there very long. Uh, maybe we can post this and send this somewhere so that you can have it later. But I want you to see that if you want to go see what people in culture and in the world are now discovering, they're saying this. In fact, here's some highlights from some of these articles. Uh, Time Magazine says that there is a positive association between helping others and life expectancy because helping others like reduces stress. Same exact article says this, studies have shown that older people who are generous tend to have better health. Research has indicated that being generous is as effective as lowering blood pressure as medication or exercise. So if you got high blood pressure and you don't wanna exercise, just be generous, okay? Uh, the Gallup poll, which is a research poll, uh, did a study in 136 countries. It's not just the United States. That was one of the 136. And it said that people who donated to charity in the past month reported greater satisfaction with life. Uh, the, Hearth, the Heart Math Institute says, when you are altruistic, lending a helping hand, your oxytocin level actually goes up in your brain, which helps relieve your stress. The ascent 
says that generous people were almost three times as likely to report being happy every day than less generous people. And the same as that article said, high generosity people were 23% more likely to be satisfied with their lives overall, but they were also happier with their relationships, their jobs, their possessions, and more. As it turns out, having the highest saving, saving account balance may not be the key to happiness. Now, I love it. It makes me so happy when science catches up to what God's word has already been saying for thousands of years. And that is that you are blessed to be a blessing. So how do we develop the right heart? We have to deal with the selfish heart, to deal with the grieving heart, to develop a generous heart. And then finally, write this down, number four, we have to develop a grateful heart. This is so important. It's so important for us to develop a grateful heart. We see this in verse 15, Deuteronomy chapter 15. It says, remember, 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 remember. Circle that word, remember that you were slaves in Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. This is why I give you this commandment today to be generous. So the Bible says that the Israelites, the people of God, were actually slaves in Egypt. It's the whole story in Exodus for 430 years. So they were slaves in Egypt for 430 years. And God says to them, I don't want you to forget that. Think about that. Because I think for me, I'd be like, well, I don't want to remember that time in my life. But God says, no, I want you to remember that. I want you to remember that. I want you to never forget that 430 years. In fact, over and over again, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, just go, it's like a thread that is from Genesis all the way to Revelation. You'll see verses over and over again that always encourage us to remember. And so the question asker that, my, that I am and my brain, whenever I see that, I'm like, why? God, why would you tell us over and over again in your word to remember the past? Don't you want us to move on from the past? Why do you want us to remember? And I think it's because of two reasons. One is because it's so easy to forget. I think it's so easy for us to forget what God's done in our life. And he said, I don't want you to forget. I want you to remember what I've done in your life. And then second, I think the reason is because every time that we remember, it fills our heart with gratitude. When we think about what God's done in our life, I don't know about you, but I can't help but be thankful. Listen, you never need to forget what God has done in your life, never. It's so important for you and I to consistently look back and remember why. Because when we do, it'll help us to develop a grateful heart. Now, oftentimes in my quiet time, it's like my personal one-on-one -on -one time with God that I spend every single morning. I carve out time in my day. I get up before everybody in my house and I, and I just spend time with God. I read my Bible, I pray, I worship. I just connect with God. It's so much more about just connecting with God more than it is about checking off spiritual disciplines. And I'm just investing in my personal one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. I'm not studying for messages. I don't care. Sometimes he'll give me a verse that applies like this week. I told you that Jeremiah verse came from that time. But the reason why I do it is because I just want to spend time with God because I love him and I want a close relationship. I need a close relationship with him. And oftentimes in my quiet time, I don't know if this happens to you, but God has a way of always bringing up my past. And, and he'll just remind me Almost every day, he'll remind me of where I've come from. He'll remind me of what my life was like before I decided to follow Jesus. He'll remind me what he did for me on June 25th, 1999, the day that I went all in with God and fully surrendered everything. I gave him my life. He'll remind me of what he's done in my life. He'll remind me what he's done in my family. He'll remind me what he's done in my marriage. He'll remind me of what he's done in my children. He'll remind me of the miracles that we've experienced, the healing that we've seen our little boy go through. He'll remind me of so many things over and over again from my past. He'll remind me of how he's always led me. He'll remind me of how he's always provided for me, how he's always been faithful, 
how he's, how he's always been so consistent, how he's always been there for me. And the truth is, like everything good in my life is because of what God has done in my life. And I don't know about you, but I never wanna forget what God has done in my life. I don't ever wanna forget where God has taken me. I don't ever wanna get used to what God has done in my life. I don't ever wanna become hard hearted and just so nonchalant about the miracles that God has done in my life. I, I don't want it just to become common and normal. Like I don't want what God has done in my life to never not be a big deal. Because when I remember where I've come from, when I remember what God has done in my life, listen, when I remember what God has already given, when I remember John 3, 16, when I remember the fact that God loved me so much, that he loved you so much, that he loved the entire world so much, that he did what people who are in love do. He, he gave, he led the way in generosity. He gave, but he didn't give money. He gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. When I remember that, I can't help but be grateful. And I can't help but be generous. L listen, the only logical response to that level of generosity that we just read is to be generous. So how do we develop the right heart? We gotta deal with the selfish heart. We gotta deal with the grieving heart. We gotta develop a generous heart. And we have to develop a grateful heart heart. Church, let me remind you, never forget, it's not about money. It's about the heart.